Hello, everyone. I'm glad you're joining us for another episode of In the Community. I'm your host, Jennifer Beck. Think of someone you know who is a missionary. Perhaps your church supports a person or a family serving in another country, or maybe you've read stories about missionaries from years past. David Livingston, Steve Saint, Gladys Alward, or just a few names worth researching if you haven't done so already. But you know, being a missionary does not require packing up and moving around the world. God has called each of us right where we are. There are needs in your community. Today, we're talking about that very thing. And I have two guests in the studio. We'll start with Pastor Jonathan Berkey. Pastor Jonathan Berkey and Pastor Frank Esteluz, guests today on In the Community. Really looking forward to this conversation that we are going to have. And as I alluded to in our introduction, we're going to start out with Pastor Jonathan, pastor of Elm Street Church of the Nazarene. And you're right there in the middle of the city. You are every day in the heart of it. And I'm just going to ask you a basic question. I think I know how you're going to answer it. Do we have needs in our community? So many, so many. And honestly, being, being where we're located right there on the corner of West and Elm Street, we're, we're kind of in a place where we're a, we're a thoroughfare. Mm. You know, there are folks uh, that walk by our church for so many different reasons. Kids walking to Lima Senior to and from in the morning, uh, Liberty Arts Magnet. Mm. Uh, there, there are people around lunchtime that are heading over to the soup kitchen, our daily bread to get lunch. There are people that just are walking or riding bikes to work all throughout the day to and from. But just, just being where we're at, um, there has been just an awareness that has grown inside of me of mm. the various needs that are, that are just prevalent in our community. There are so many. You know, we often hear about, we want people to come to church, come to church. We do want people to come to church, but ultimately we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus. How are you seeing that now that you are in the location where you are? How are you seeing ways that the church can be that, specifically here in Lima, with what you see as the needs here in this region? So I, I don't want to claim that we're doing a great job yet of, of really being the hands and feet of Jesus, but we definitely have started identifying some needs. And there are three or four areas of need that have become really evident to us. One of them are issues of urban poverty, um, particularly among children. There are just, there are situations of abuse and neglect and um, kids that are, that are really trying to make it. And mm. so we've been kind of asking our question, how can we just be a resource for the children that are around us? You know, Child and Family Services in Lima is, is doing the best that they can, mm. I really think, to address a lot of the domestic issues. You know, we could always use more foster parents in mm -hmm. the system if you're watching this, and that mm -hmm. would be something maybe the Lord would stir in your spirit. Um, but we can't report every home and we can't adopt every child, at least not right now. And so the, the question we're asking is, okay, how do we engage at least the children in our neighborhood with the gospel? Another area of great need is we are, we are a town, just as many towns are in the Midwest, that is riddled with, with individuals that struggle with substance abuse. Mm. And um, th there's, a, there's a serious you know, drug situation in Lima and so we have just connected with different recovery houses that are around us and have wanted to just be a place um, for community and accountability for people who are serious about getting off the streets and coming out of a life of addiction. Uh, that's another area of need. Uh, mental, men mental health is, is, a, is, a, is a situation that I think affects everyone in different ways, but we, we are asking ourselves the question, you know, how can we be a church that is sensitive to the different mental health needs that we see. The greatest compliment that I will say that I've received so far as pastoring down on Elm Street is that there was a woman who came in with schizophrenia and I don't know what her past traumas have mm -hmm. been, but she waited for me at the end of the service and she just came up to me, had a difficult time with eye contact and she said, hey, I want you to know that this, this is the first church I've ever felt safe in. Mm. And she just left. Mm. You know, and, and again, I don't, I don't know how the gospel is going to address her needs, you know, but there's, there's in, just incredible needs, uh, you know, so um, the, and so children in the inner city, the drug situation, mental health crisis, but also um, the immigration situation in Lima, where we are, we are kind of a, at a crossroads of, of different services, 
social services and people looking for uh, help kind of in the in the urban center and we have just really identified in early on that we wanted to be a church that would be open that would open our doors to people who are non natives to the United States and maybe even not even English speakers. And mm -hmm. so it's been quite an adventure <laughs> trying to figure out how to minister to people that maybe we don't even speak their language, but they're here and they're on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. And um, Jesus says, love your neighbor. <laughs> and they're definitely our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're still trying to figure out what that ministry will look like with, with our immigrant neighbors. And we're gonna talk about that quite a bit in just a moment. We have Pastor Frank here. We're gonna bring him into the conversation, but I wanna jump back to one thing you mentioned about the needs in the community because I think even even for me to be honest I live in the city but it's easy not to see some of the things you just mentioned and you mentioned children in poverty without giving us names of course or actual situations can you describe for our viewers what that looks like how are these children living do you know what their lives are like uh, there are there are children that live lives of neglect you know you can go to a home and find that there are five or six children you know, running around in, in a space that maybe you and I wouldn't see fit to be raising children in it, but they're there, you know, and um, they have they have many needs. Um, I know I put you on the spot. We didn't talk about this ahead of sure, time, sure, but it sure. just kind of, it just stung, <clears throat> stuck with me that that is something that is, that, that's happening here. Yeah, um, and I, um, I'm very, I'm very aware that, that different, different parents, they parent differently and, mm -hmm. and, and again, the, the goal of the church is not necessarily um, to take people's children for them or oh, to, course, or to come into their home and try to force them to parent in a particular way, but it is to share the gospel, the goodness and the love of Jesus with them that they might come to know the Savior. And so for us, you know, um, in this first year, um, we've, we've hosted a vacation Bible school, just opening mm -hmm. the doors, you know, of our, of our church to neighborhood kids. That was kind of a a first opportunity for many of them to get to know us and us to get to know them. And several of them have, have wandered back and have come mm -hmm. back and we've just been developing a relationship with them where they're coming back on Sundays and coming back on Wednesdays. And as we continue to grow and develop, we are praying and we're asking the Lord to help us identify how consistently and sustainably we can continue to minister mm. to children's to children and families. I yeah. mean, it, yeah. um, that, that's, a, that's another thing, you know, um, no one, no one is too lost that the gospel can't save them, right? No one is too far from uh, the call of Jesus. And so we're just trying to find ways to graciously extend our hands into, into these home situations um, and to be listening ears when people would come to us and needing help and, and try to extend as much grace and help as is appropriate and as we can. You know, in the church, we oftentimes like to um, chalk up our successes based off of how many people prayed the sinner's prayer. But there is such an importance in the steps of kindness and reaching out and just showing generosity and just showing love, the love of Jesus to people. Well, that's a really great point. There was actually a homeless man um, that came to us a couple of months ago, and he asked us if he could, if he could live and stay where we keep our trash. There's kind of this this overhang mm -hmm. area on the back side of our church, and you know he didn't he didn't really want anything else. He just wanted a place to sleep, and so we, we said, yeah, that's fine. And so we, he he um, he came and he started sleeping there. And as a church, we actually met about this individual because a lot of pe different people had different ideas. You know, we wanted to get him housing. We wanted to everyone had different ideas of how to kind mm -hmm. of fix his situation. Well, he didn't want any of that. He just wanted to just wanted a place to put his sleeping bag, and. And so we, we just agreed that, hey, so what we're gonna do is we're going to just continue to love him. We're just gonna conti continue to extend grace, right? Mm -hmm. And so a uh, couple weeks in, uh, one of the girls in the church, you know, uh, came, uh, she had been bringing him donuts, you know, during Sunday, he didn't want to come in. Well, eventually he came in the doors of the church, right? <laughs> and and that's, a, that's a long story, but, but even um, to, to what you just said, kind of to the point of how do you measure success? Mm -hmm. Well, love. <laughs> There, there's no way to quantify mm -hmm. the success of love. I mean, Jesus had to have in some ways felt like a failure on the cross as he's hanging there thinking to himself, these are the people I came to save mm -hmm. and they're crucifying me. Mm -hmm. And his compassionate response in that moment is not to preach some massive sermon, but it's to pray, Father, forgive them mm -hmm. 
just to shower them with compassion. They, they don't understand. Yeah. They don't understand what they're doing. And I, I don't know that I've gained any more understanding since I've come to the church on Elm Street, but I really do think that I've grown incredibly in compassion. Mm. Compassion, so we've got compassion for poverty, compassion for those struggling with addictions, compassion for those who are struggling with mental addictions, and then we're gonna move into the discussion of immigrants who are coming to our region, and that's gonna, we're gonna invite Pastor Frank into the conversation. Uh, Pastor Jonathan, why don't you introduce Pastor Frank? Let us know how you got to know him and how he got connected with, with the church. So I met Pastor Frank really because of a relationship with another pastor. Last Christmas, several of us in the church thought it might be a good idea to bake cinnamon rolls no. and walk them on, on Sunday morning, or not on Sunday morning, on Christmas morning, to take them around to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so we baked a bunch of cinnamon rolls and we walked the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the house, one of the houses across the street from us uh, was inhabited by several, fr several people from Haiti that didn't speak English. And so we gave the cinnamon rolls, we sang some Christmas carols, we exchanged greetings and hugs, and it was very warm, but we didn't know what they had said to us, and they don't, I don't think they knew what we had said to them. And so um, it, was a, it was a couple of months later that a man speaking Haitian Creole came to our service. He was dressed very nice, and he stayed after the service to talk to me, and I got a, a, um, my friend Mark, mm -hmm. who's a translator, to help me translate, and the man said to me, I know you. And I, I was thinking to myself, I, I, don't, I, don't, I think you're mistaken. I don't know you. <laughs> and he said, no, you are, you are the man. You are the people who brought sweet bread to our home on Christmas Day. I call that the ministry of food. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, yes. That's, a, that's an important thing. <laughs> and his name was Patrick. And he said to me, he said, I'm a pastor. And he said, several of us have been traveling to Finley to worship. Um, there are some folks that have been traveling to Springfield to worship. Would you be open to having a conversation about us worshiping here. And I said, well, you know, of course. And so we got, to, so he was connected with Pastor Frank and uh, several others, and we got together with our church board and just had a conversation of is the Spirit, you know, opening this opportunity for us to have a place where people who only speak Haitian Creole can come and worship. You know, in our services on Sunday morning, we translate the sermon into Spanish, and we have Spanish on, on the screens as we're singing, we do some things in Spanish. Um, we, we're not equipped right now to do Haitian Creole as well, right? And so, so really, um, it, it began with some cinnamon rolls, but then it transpired into a larger conversation. And Pastor Frank uh, joined the conversation. And Pastor Frank is actually an ordained elder in the Christian church, mm -hmm. uh, was introduced really to the United States, really through some connections in the Christian church, mm -hmm. um, the schools that he went to, his, his children went to. And so we are kindred spirits and uh, mm -hmm. just have a lot in common. A lo I would say a lot more in common than different. Yes. <laughs> With our topic turning to the Haitian culture, I want to recognize that this has already had a lot of focus nationwide. Today, though, we're not here to talk about politics, government programs, emotions, or even opinions. Instead, let's talk about kindness, the power of a smile, and a universal love among believers. That love for having an opportunity to go to church. Here's more of my conversation with Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Frank. Yeah. So, Pastor Frank, tell me what you see uh, you are within the Haitian culture here in Lima, and what are you seeing as far as people's hearts toward God? You are, are you hosting church service here uh, taking place weekly? Yes. Um, we are very happy and to explain something about the difference, you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying, because, you know, there is a big difference between, uh, like, Haitian people and Haiti, like people here, when they come here, like um, they see things a little bit different sometimes. Uh, they need people, like our biggest problem right now is when they come here, they don't have call to come to church. That's when we need to go to pick them up and to drive them to, to church. And like um, they, there was a big, a big problem here in Lima because when I first came here, there was not any Asian church at all. Mm. You see, for that's why Pastor Patrick and I we went to Springfield and Finley, like to to go to to church. That means this is where I knew there was Haitian church. 
but with Pastor Jonathan, we start here like, I realize people, there are many people I have met before, they say, I don't have any problem to live with in Lima, but my biggest problem because I don't have any church to go. Mm. You see, and mm -hmm. that hurt me when they say mm -hmm. that as a pastor, and every Sunday, and I have to drive almost two hours to go to church at Springfield. And I say to Pastor Patrick and Warner, we have another phone call, Warner. That's when I say, no, it's not possible. We have possibility to have car just to drive to go to Springfield for church, but mm -hmm. what about with the other people? And since then I stay home, I never go. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to church. I say, God, mm -hmm. um, please show me what to do because I know what the ministry is. Like, I, I realize you called me to Lima for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I see the reason why I am here in Lima. I want you to help me, please, to see how I can help my people to go to church because they really want to go to church. And then I realize Pastor Jonathan is the answer of my prayer yeah. from God. <laughs> yeah, like. Explain to me what you felt in your heart when you started not only seeing the large population of Haitians move into our area, but recognizing this desire for there to be an opportunity to worship here. Well, so one of the things that was really happening after we went to that house, and the Lord had already been stirring. We had already started a Spanish-speaking Bible study, and I was aware of the influx of Haitians. Mm -hmm. um, we had been praying, Lord, open the doors that you want us to walk through as far as ministry is concerned. We had been praying that as a church. And really, a large the, the barrier with ministry to those who speak Haitian Creole really is the language, mm -hmm. particularly for me. And, and so the, the, you know, the plea to the Lord was, Lord, if you want us to do this ministry, you're going to have to provide for us. And then in the door walks Pastor Patrick, and in the door walks Pastor Frank. You know? And you, you think about, I love the line in Acts 15, where the early church is getting together and they're trying to figure out how to incorporate Gentiles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And they come together with this pact and they say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It's one of my favorite verses in scripture. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, we're still, we're still working this out yeah. with fear and trembling. Yeah. <laughs> we're working it out, but, but it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And it mm -hmm. continues to seem good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And, and so we just continue to hold hands and kind of walk into the ministries mm -hmm. and the doors that are opening to us. So tell me what you're doing. Are you holding a weekly service? Uh, like, because we, we have service every Sunday. We start at two to four. And then recently, that's been last week, we start a prayer meeting every Friday at seven at the mm. church with the people. Okay, and uh, what kind of a response are you seeing? Are, are people coming? Yes, yes. Uh, like I need to be available to go to, to pick them up and to drive them to, to church and drive them back to, to their house. Like, it's, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. I, I enjoy doing that. You see, I enjoy doing that. Yeah. It's, it's really good for them. And they are happy. They start being happy. They say, okay, now I feel more comfortable because I have church to go. And, you know, they go to work. And then it's, it's, it's really good until now. <laughs> now, if you guys are willing to answer this, just because I know people at home are wondering, they... It's, we see the, the Haitian community everywhere, in Walmart, everywhere, and people are wondering, how, why are there so many people coming here? Why so many people have come here in such a short period of time? Uh, is it for jobs? Is it because yes, of the government because, programs? Know, is like, it because of the, the, cult, the, the danger in Haiti? I mean, what is it that has brought so many people here so quickly? Yes, uh, because of the dangers in Haiti, because, you know, there are many people, they can, they can go even to school, they can go to work. That's been violence, they kill people, that's been the gang, gangster, like, that shoot people, that's been almost every day. And when they got possibility, you know, like, humanitarian payroll, you understand what I'm saying? Humanitarian payroll, the, the payroll. Like me, the program President Biden. Program. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. This is like there are many. We have many relatives here or friends. They mm -hmm. fill out immigration paper for them, and that's when immigration call them, and then they give them possibility to come, not become they, not because they choose to come by themselves, 
but immigration because they fill out paper for them and to send to immigration and immigration say okay you approve and they give them a travel document they give them to come here but in Lima or how personally but they come here the reason because you know if they stay in Florida like it's not too easy to get job mm. but it's mm -hmm. easier for them yeah. so we have about five yeah. minutes left okay. in our conversation <laughs> and uh so so you talk about treating people mm -hmm. we want to treat people the way god wants us to treat people so how can we do that how can the viewers who are living in lima who are living in the community who are spending time in the grocery stores or places how can we treat the people in our community regardless of their color their nationality any of that stuff, how can we treat them the way God wants? You know, one of the things that I've noticed as I've been spending time with more and more people that are in the immigrant community is that many of them have different experiences. You know, I'll have conversations with some folks from Haiti. I, I just this last week, I had a conversation with a couple who said, it has been absolutely wonderful living in Lima. Everyone's so hospitable. I go to the grocery store, people are waving at me, smiling at me. I mean, their perspective was just, this is the most wonderful and hospitable place to live. And I thought to myself, wow, that's, that's amazing. That is mm -hmm. Lima at its best. You've been running into the very best people, mm -hmm. right? And there are other people that would say, I, you know, I, I just try to keep my head down and not draw any attention to myself because I've, I've felt some tension or maybe some animosity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think that we don't recognize how we can affect people that we don't know that we interact with in public mm -hmm. just by smiling, mm -hmm. yeah. just by being courteous, just by being kind. The couple that I was just referencing, they were not having deep relationships with, with these other people in Lima. They were just expressing that they, that they had been just shown general kindness, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's just at a very basic level. I think that we ought to be aware of the power that we have. Um, and, and even as Christians, I mean, we are to be the fragrance of Christ, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is, this is a, a time for us to, to be bringing, bringing people together through our own hospitality and goodwill and kindness, you know? So that, that, would, be, that would be one way that I would say that the church can can address this issue. Another would, another would be maybe even the way that we're talking about immigration. You know, many people are afraid to talk about immigration because anytime we say that word, it maybe feel like, it, it might feel like we're, the conversation needs to be turning political. Well, the fact of the matter is we, we live in a town where there are many immigrants. As Pastor Frank was saying, there have been many jobs that have been available for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And there are people from other countries right now that are filling those roles. And there are some manufacturers that are very happy mm -hmm. to have these, these immigrants here. Um, and the majority of the vast majority of them are fully documented, completely legal. Um, I, I saw a number from uh, Job and Family Services um, that it's under 10%, it's less than 10%. So it's a small minority that there are any sort of documentation issues with. And of that number, an even smaller minor minority would be what anyone would consider some sort of illegal mm. immigrant. Mm -hmm. And so even just the way that we talk about immigration, recognizing that not, it's not a, the large group of immigrants that are here in an illegal way or against the mandates of our country, but that there are people just like you and I who are trying to make the best out of their lives, that are trying to make ends meet for their own families, that are trying to flee from civil unrest and persecution where they might be. And so just having, having that kind of sense of generosity and compassion, I think, can go a long way. All right, I think we're down to, oh, go ahead. We have yeah. one minute left. <laughs> okay, no, well, it goes some, fast. <laughs> Sometimes sometime I wonder if when someone is try to mistreat the, someone else, I wonder if, that person really understand what does that mean. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said something in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. That means uh, treat the others the, one, the way you want to be treated. Mm. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, when, when I realize someone start mistreated someone, I wonder if that person consider himself or herself mm. as a human being. Mm. They're, not, they're not thinking about, they're, they're letting yes. their emotions or their whatever the thoughts are take over and yes. they're not stopping to ponder that. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because to treat someone well, you need to know how to treat yourself. Mm. If that's mean, as soon as I realize someone try to mistreat someone else, I start thinking, 
do that person uh, does that person know how to treat himself mm -hmm. or herself mm -hmm. but because if you know how to treat yourself i think this is exactly the way you will you will know at the same time have how to treat the others mm -hmm. yes. I, I remember i have talked to pastors and other ones i said well no one respect you that means you work you work for your own respect and mm. people join you in your own respect you have chosen yes you see what I'm saying? That means that's if someone appears disrespectful to me, that means what, what will be my first intention? Mm -hmm. That means mm -hmm. being disrespectful to you. Did I, that means did I choose to be disrespectful to you? No. That means you, you appear uh, someone who's not, that means who doesn't have respect for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then I go to the same direction with you. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't choose to be that's been to not yeah. be disrespectful for you. This is exactly, and I understand what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, yes. verse 12. That's been the way you want other people treat you, that's been treat them in the same way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you a final 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, I, I'm just, I'm so glad to be a part of what God is doing in Lima, Ohio right now. And there are a lot of people that are naysayers in our community, people that would, um, would want to make you believe that there's more despair than hope mm. in the world today, but I fundamentally disagree. I think the kingdom of God is advancing in, in mighty, mighty ways. And I'm so glad to be a part of what God's doing in downtown Lima and what God's doing in the Haitian community. Mm. Yeah. God's on the move in Lima, Ohio. Mm -hmm. All right, Pastor Jonathan Berkey, Pastor Frank, Estelouz, I just can't get that <laughs> French Creole pronunciation. <laughs> Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Frank, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having <laughs> thank you, you for having us. We'll close now with that final scripture that Pastor Frank mentioned, Matthew 7, 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. In all things you do today, treat others the way God would treat them and also the way you would desire to be treated as well. What kind thing can you do for someone else today? And by the way, be kind to yourself in the process. Thanks again for watching this episode of In the Community. I'm your host, Jennifer Beck.